right, good morning. My name is Christoph Klein, I said. Um, so I would like to start asking a question. Who has actually ever heard of mechanism design? And Roger Mayerson was awarded the Nobel Prize in uh, 2007 alongside with Eric Maskin and Leonid Huvitz. Other people from that branch are, ah, there we go. Um, other people from that branch are uh, Holstrom and Hart, so they're more in the contract theory kind of area, but yeah. So, so wh wh why have I picked up on that thing? Yeah, because it has been basically neglected by Austrian economics and uh, um, except by one who's sitting in the back and uh, I want to talk about it. So I consider this idea of mechanism design actually quite dangerous and uh, it has to do with moral hazard and um, negative externalities and I'm going to try to do a kind of reinterpretation of what actually a negative externality means in the market context. So that's the abstract. I'm not going to read my abstract now. So I'm just going to start with a few um, quotes just to set the scene. And I think they are quite interesting. So I'm going to stick close here. So basically what they say is that we have incentive products. I'm going to talk about what actually incentives means. And what they've been saying about Hayek, and these are mostly quotes from the Nobel Prize speech, is that to analyze questions about efficient institutions that were beyond the analytical reach of economic theory of Hayek's day. So what they say is actually that Hayek's couldn't do things they can do. So with that tool set, actually, uh, they, they are filling a void. And what, what Mayerson is saying is, okay, now we have the tool set not only to look at resource allocations, now we can talk about actually uh, institutions and incentive compatibility. So uh, they now have a kind of tool set uh, uh, with which to work. So w what does it tell scholars from the Austrian school? So, so what I'm saying is basically on both sides of the Atlantic, they were mostly mute except one guy, actually it's called Robin Murphy. Uh, he has been talking yesterday and I had a quick chat about it. And, and he has been commenting on it. And uh, so again, I'm not gonna read it. Um, what he's saying is just in the second one, mechanism theory shows that incentive constraint should be considered co-equally with resource constraint. So there's nothing wrong with it. And um, so the main point is that it allegedly doesn't pose a threat. I, I think actually it, it poses in a way a threat because it, it assumes the same top-down view on the economic system, this time from the institutional side. So this time they work actually through an incentive mechanism to get the framework right and then jump back into the resource allocation because why would you actually amend institutions in order to arrive obviously at a more just or whatever resource allocation because otherwise you wouldn't be doing that, yeah? So, so um, uh, one guy actually called it, it's basically reverse engineering and I actually agree to that. So, but um, Robert was the only one from the Austrian school that actually picked up on it. I haven't found anything else. I've talked to you, Robert, yesterday, and you don't know of anybody who has actually written a piece in any of the journals. And it's, it's, it's in the other area, actually, quite some people are actually working on that. So l let me try to contextualize what, what, where they're coming from. So first of all, obviously, markets always fail. Yeah. So, and, and, and what they say is that based on the assumption that a mechanism exists that incentivizes people to report their true information honestly, yeah? So obviously you have that kind of benevolent dictator or public agency or whatever, yeah? So the mechanism is actually a social plan and they want to obviously have an incentive compatible plan and to arrive at the wanted resource allocation. And what they mostly talk about is about moral hazard and adverse selection. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So these are all the buzzwords, information, asymmetry, negative externality, inefficient allocation, incomplete markets, and then 
the principal agent uh, uh, settings. So we have two kinds of, of, of externalities here. The one is moral hazard, this is a hidden action, and the other one is adverse selection, this is actually hidden information. And I assume that everybody has heard about these uh, terms, they are quite important, and um, so I, I consider them negative externalities but in a positive sense because they are kind of market signal also. They are not kind of prices but they communicate a cost in the marketplace and actually we can do something about it. Yeah? So you, you, you don't actually accept somebody imposing cost on you all the time yeah? in a free market at least because you have the free right to negotiate actually on what's being done. Yeah? And that can be in the contractual area but that can also be more on a social level if we talk about pollution in your environment, for instance. Yeah? So, what my approach is that in a non-zero-sum world, actually, under conditions of uncertainty and ignorance, uh, the market externalities, moral hazard and adverse selection, are they actually systematic or non-systematic? And they are non-systematic. Yeah? So the point is, if you look at human action, you have stable local societies, actually. They, they don't talk about institutions. Yeah? Autochthonous societies, they are stable and they keep where they are. I'm living in South Africa. If you travel through many regions of Africa, you still have actually uh, societies with extremely stable uh, so, uh, institutions. So they, they are not going to uh, talk about multiple institutions. Yeah? But you also have in our division of labor, the central market, you also have stable institutions. So if, if you have multiple institutions, you do that because things are changing. So you have positive externalities, which actually to me is the market itself. So it's, it's one big positive externality, otherwise we wouldn't be doing that. And you have negative. And there you go with the hidden action and hidden information. And you have two kinds of branches. You have the moral hazard and you have the adverse selection. And the one is very important, it's ex post, where you find out thereafter. And then you have hidden information where your strategy actually depends on ex ante. So you know before what you're actually going to do. And obviously the insurance market is one of those famous uh, examples, the Akelov lemons market. Everybody has heard about. So the, the thing is now, are institutions incentive compatible? Yeah. So uh, um, Meyerson is obviously praising Hurwitz, who was the first to systematically deal with it, and he's again a quote, taking a long step beyond Hayek and advancing our ability to analyze fundamental problems of institutions. I think that's wrong. So. Now we have incentive constraints and not resource constraints anymore. And I want to ask actually, an incentive definition for Merriam Webster is actually something that incites or has a tendency to incite to de de determination or action. So if markets may not elicit honest reports, what they say is actually then you have inefficient allocation and you need an institutional redesign. That's what they say. But again, this presupposes that uh, you know where you're going. So again, you need to have an idea about the resource allocation you want to have. So it, 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 it's still all the same, just that you work your way now through institutional design and, and tweak the rules. Yeah? So what would Hayek actually say about incentive compatibility? Yeah? I, I think actually it's a complete tautology. Yeah? Because uh, what should that mean actually to have a compatible incentive. What they mean by that is actually it may not actually achieve the results from the perspective of some external, uh, uh, le let's say, let's call it mediator or public agent. Yeah? So, so I think actually that incentive compatibility is a contradiction in terms. Yeah? You either have an incentive or not. What, what actually goes wrong in, 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 in systematic moral hazard like monetary policy or public infrastructures actually that your institutional environment is wrong. It's not the incentives that's wrong. The people still actually they even act morally in a way that they actually abide by the 
a legal framework and regulatory framework if they pick up on a, let's say, a, a risk mitigation by an export credit agency or something like that. So they behave according to the law. So uh, it, it just uh, brings about a bad result for, for ourselves as the taxpayer if they do so. So what I'm saying here, if, if people uh, ex post regard outcomes as detrimental, then this does not mean that the incentives that guided the actions actually were wrong. Yeah, and, 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 and that's what you very often read. I don't actually even think that there are no such thing in a market economy as perverse ex incentives. You read that quite often. No, the institutions are perverse, but not the incentives. Because they are the same. We want to be better off, we want to get rich or whatever, we want to be healthy. So the incentives are pretty, pretty universal. Yeah. So I think that whole incentive compatibility is a kind of categorical error. So my view actually on is, if you look at negative externalities, you look at market results exposed and something you don't recognize and of, of the one you recognize actually you have unacceptable and acceptable ones. Yeah? And the unacceptable ones is adverse selection. And what you do is you learn. You actually, if you, if, if, if you encounter that, you learn. Uh, yeah? And that's what we do. And if you have moral hazard, it's institutional change or contractual change. You try to change uh, actually what's happening. In, in a bilateral relationship between two firms, actually do something about it. Yeah? Um, then, the acceptable ones are frictions, so transaction costs. For, for some aspects, transaction costs are so high, you accept it that you can't solve it. Yeah? So you accept transactional costs because uh, the mitigation of those would be too costly. And then the funny one, actually, it's market results. Yeah? And, and where the fun comes in is actually that some people say, oh no, it's, it's a market failure. Yeah? Let's say natural monopoly. Yeah? like utilities, uh, telecom, in, in, in the past, until the 90s. Yeah? So they say it's a natural monopoly. So it's being defined as a market failure, though the people would have accepted it, actually. So I'm going to skip that point, though it's quite important, yeah? uh, because just one, one. So what they all do, all from mechanism design, they have those payout mattresses. Yeah? And they put in stuff in there and then say, this is a dominant strategy. And here we see that if people do not elicit honest reports of their, their whatever true preferences, then it doesn't work. Yeah? But the thing is, are these numbers actually able to represent the true cost-benefit profile of people? I'd say no, because then you had to know the full psychological profile of the people. Yeah, but you, you can't have costs in that. You, you only have benefits and, 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 and costs in a separate manner, but it's not the, not the full psychological problem. So I think the whole mechanism design actually is premised on, on, on quite simplistic ideas of payout matrices. They are not representative of the true profile of the people. So I want to show one last one. So does mechanism design give us actually a new tool set, as they say, to achieve better resource allocation? And I think it, it's old wine and new bottles, yeah? It's continuing the discussion that actually Mises Hayek and Langer and Lerner had a long time ago. And, uh, you know, Huerta de Soto has uh, published a, a paper a long time back. It's called The Methodenstreit is Far From Over. Yeah, it's ongoing. Yeah? And in a way, even if you look at the mathematics they do, it's still kind of arrow de Brue and Wara. I call it reloaded. So it's about resource allocations. Yeah? And this is what I was referring to at the beginning, uh, that it's actually reverse engineering. So the final one is actually a punchline, and, and, and this is quite funny, I think. Um, so two things. Meyerson said in 27, the problem of getting people to act obediently to a social plan is called moral hazard. Yeah? I find that quite incredible, actually. Yeah, so you see where they're coming from, 
And now comes the best. In the case of moral hazard, socialism exacerbates moral hazard problems. So actually he sees that the market, you know, can do something good. And then he's saying, in case of adverse selection problems, socialist institutional design may be better suited to elicit honest reports of hidden information on the basis that socialism allows individuals to have less property rights. So what does that say? It says, if you make people, you, people become more honest if you make them poorer. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you for your presentation. Now it's time for the questions. Do you have questions? Okay, please. <laughs> Hi, uh, yeah, just a, a brief clarification, because that article you quoted from me was from 12 years ago, and you're right, I was surprised. I said, I said it doesn't pose a threat, and I went to the context. What I meant was the, the people, so when, the, when these guys won the Nobel Prize, the press was reporting it like, ah, new noblists show the flaws with the free market. And so what I meant was, no, if we look at their case, there is no real criticism against the market. The government can't improve. So I'm saying this doesn't pose a threat to the free market. That, that, that's what I meant. So I, oh, agree okay. with, yeah, so I agree with you. If I learned that a bunch of economists are working on this, I would be nervous that they're yeah. going to come up with anti-market recommendations. But what I meant was there's no real legitimate academic critique so, of the market here. So what you say, it, it, it's so, let's say, besides the point that it doesn't pose a threat. <laughs> like in the sense, like if somebody said, oh, you Austrians are afraid of math, yeah. and you can only believe Austrian economics, and I would say, no, math doesn't pose a threat to Austrian economics. You see okay. what I'm saying? So there, if someone's a mathematical economist, likely the person's not Austrian, but it's not that math is a problem we have to deal with, and it's awkward. That, that's all I meant. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think we have time for one short question, if we have. Uh, yes, uh, hi, uh, Georgi Gane from Bulgaria. Uh, would you think that Eric Maskin and Leo Hurwitz would share this opinion? You, you know, if you ask me what would I like to discuss with them, I, I would ask them what they think about actually incentive and incentive compatibility. For, for me, that's lunatic, yeah? Uh, I don't understand what somebody talks about if he talks about incentive compatibility. I don't know what they even try to tell me. Because that means that I don't know actually, you know, in the first place, what is incentive compatible. So, so it's very important to distinguish between incentive and institutions. Yeah? And, 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 and if you talk about moral hazard, yeah, then in ex ante, you act according to your incentives. But you might create institutions yeah, that are either bad or there is some, I think Hayek has said it, unknowledge. Yeah? Sometimes we don't know. And then you know, things go wrong and we learn. Yeah? And then we rectify. But if you have actually, uh, 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 um, and, and, and that's, I just want to go, off. sorry, I have to show that. So I call that actually the moral hazard of second order because now you have a systematic element. You can't rectify anymore something which is put in a law framework. And I would ask them also that. Yeah? Be, 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 because you know, if you have this monetary policy or let's say an export credit finance, people tap into it and they do it legally. Yeah? So there is no way out. So it's becoming systematic. You can't negotiate anymore. Whereas the true moral hazard and the true adverse selection, it's going to impose a cost on us and we do something about it. And if you talk about, you know, like countries in Africa, my opinion is the problem that they are where they are is they have too few externalities. They need more because if you have a lot of externalities, they do, then, you know, you have something to do about, yeah? So I, I don't have a problem with externalities. That's, that's what we face every day. You know, you go in a traffic jam and so on, yeah? So, so I think there is a fundamental misunderstanding of the notion of externalities. Okay, thank you for your presentation.